reach out and touch the Lord as He passes by. You'll find He's not too busy to hear your cry. He's passing by this moment, your needs to supply. Reach out. Tonight, let's take our Bibles and turn in the Old Testament to the book of Psalms. We're going to look at Psalm 87 and 88 tonight under the title, Prayer for Help in Despondency. We are all so beset by despondency and depression. And uh, sometimes it's maybe just situational occasionally. Sometimes it seems to be clinical. Uh, constant. In any event, there is help in God's word for uh, our despondency. So let's open in prayer, shall we? Father, we're grateful for this chance to study your word. Help us to really understand it and be really changed by it. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 87 is a uh, psalm about the glories in Jerusalem. And the psalmist is uh, there in Jerusalem. This is written by one of the sons of Korah. And uh, it talks about the glories of uh, Jerusalem. They call it Zion. We're going to see here that God has established Jerusalem uh, as the center of worship at that time. And now, of course, the center of worship is where? It's in your own heart. But in the millennium, once again, the center of worship is going to be in Jerusalem. That's where the king is going to be, and this is very much looking forward to the millennium, when you and I are going to be back here in our resurrection bodies, and one of the jobs that we're going to have, and it's not going to be the easiest job you're going to have, is to get people to get over to Jerusalem to see the king. They're not going to want to go. The Bible talks about that and says if you don't go, you don't get any rain on your land. Without rain, you don't get any food. So the Lord Jesus today is saying, go to church if you're so moved. In those days, you're going to, he's going to say, get over here or you're going to starve. So that's a good, strong uh, inducement for church attendance, isn't it? Huh? In any event, worship in Jerusalem. And uh, he starts off in verse 1, talking about how glorious Zion is. His foundation, God's foundation here on earth, is in the holy mountains. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of you, O city of God. I will make mention of Rahab and Babylon to those who know me. Behold, O Philistia and Tyre with Ethiopia, this one was born there. And of Zion it will be said, this one and that one were born in her, and the Most High himself shall establish her. The Lord will record when he registers the peoples, this one was born there. Both the singers and the players and instruments say, all my springs are in you. So at that time, God was resident in Jerusalem, back in the little holy of holies in the tabernacle, later on the temple. At this time, it was the temple. And that's where God dwelt between the cherubim in that little box uh, looking down on the mercy seat. And as we mentioned in the millennium, the Lord's going to return and establish his throne right there in the temple in Jerusalem. And God's foundation is in the holy mountains. He set his foundation of his faith right there in those holy mountains around Jerusalem. And he loves the gates of Zion. He loves the gates of Zion today. He tells us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We should be praying for believers uh, to come forth. There are believers in Jerusalem. One of, the, one of my very first associate pastors left many years ago and went over there and established a church. And he's Jewish, but he has a born-again uh, believing church there. There are others as well. Pray for Jews to come to the Lord, not only in Jerusalem, but all over the world. But in the millennium, 
That's when we're going to see that, that area is going to be strong for worship for the Lord. God loves those gates. We should pray for them. More than all the dwellings of Jacob, you know, all, Israel is a wonderful land. And I have to say this, I've been over there three times, it's been a great privilege, and uh, each time I uh, landed in a different part, usually Tel Aviv, and then you, you travel up to Galilee and where Jesus was. But when you get down to Jerusalem, at least my personal experience each time was, while I loved the land and I appreciated being there and thought much about Jesus in all these different areas, when you get to Jerusalem, there is something magical that happens. I hate to use that word magical, but it seems like it. It is absolutely awesome. Almost takes your breath away. This is the city of God. No question about it. And uh, glorious things are spoken of you, O city of God. I will make mention of Rahab. Now, Rahab is a, uh, is a word for uh, uh, Egypt. And uh, it's, um, it, it has to do with one of their so-called gods, the sea monster. Uh, in the uh, Nile River. Uh, so I'll make mention of Egypt and Babylon. Uh, to those who know me, Philistia, that's uh, the, the area of the Philistines by the Mediterranean. Uh, Tyre and up there around uh, Lebanon. Ethiopia, we know where that is in Egypt. Uh, they're going to say this one was born there. They're going to want to identify with Jerusalem. They're going to want to say I was born there, that that city is important to me. Uh, and of Zion, it's going to be said, this one and that one were born in her, and the Most High himself shall establish her. So we're talking about the physical city of Jerusalem. But as we, went, we looked at our prophecy series and, and studied the word of God, especially in Revelation, uh, we saw in Revelation that there is a heavenly city of Jerusalem, which is going to be our new home. And so that's the city we also focus in on. Because while we're going to be going to the physical city of Jerusalem in the millennium to see the king. We're also going to make our home in the uh, new heaven and new earth and the holy city. Uh, Revelation 21 uh, verse 2 says, Then I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Then it goes on to talk about that wonderful city. It's a wonderful chapter. That's chapter 21 of Revelation. Uh, in that verse, chapter, verse 22, I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or moon, etc., etc. So speculation has been made about how that's going to work to have a physical city of Jerusalem, where we know it is today in Israel, and a heavenly city, which is suspended up in, uh, in the air. Uh, and some have seen, and uh, there have been depictions of this on the internet, and we've included those in our series on prophecy, that the heavenly city, uh, which is going to be large, by the way, it's going to be about 1,500 miles in each direction cubed. That's like going from uh, here down to the Ozarks in uh, Arkansas. Uh, it's about halfway across the country in each direction enough places for us to live. So we're going to live up there in that heavenly city of Jerusalem, and we're going to probably commute on down here to earth, and uh, no need to worry about commuting, because if we have an example of Jesus' resurrection body, how do you commute in, the, in that day? You just think it, boom, and you're there. It's going to be wonderful. So I see a heavenly city up there in, uh, over the earthly city down here. It's going to be very interesting. Um, so a lot to study. If you've missed any of that prophecy series, just go to the easiest ways to go to Rev Jerry Lynn and uh, just Google uh, the prophecy, the playlist series. And uh, make sure you put down the Rev part. I, I wanted to see what my net worth was the other day and I was excited because I looked on the internet and my net worth is $60 million. What's even better than that is I am not the age that I thought. I'm only 60 years old. And I was so excited to have all that money and to be so young. And, and uh, instead of being kind of puny up here, like Arnold Schwarzenegger now, and I even more so, I, I was like this. I was amazed. The problem was I was blonde. And I've never been blonde in my life. And I had the wrong Jerry Lynn. It's the professional wrestler. Now, now retired. So in any event, <laughs> uh, make sure you have Rev Jerry Lynn and avoid that other guy. And may he know the Lord. I hope he does. May he give his heart to Jesus. So it's going to be a wonderful city. And uh, 
whether it's the heavenly city in the, where your home is or the earthly city where you're helping people to get over there. Again, you'll be like a police officer saying, get on the plane, Tel Aviv or whatever the airline is at that time, and get over to worship the king. It's a wonderful city. Most importantly for us today, we always make application, pray for the city. It's not all that safe. It's subject to bombs and attacks and what have you. Pray for the people in the city that they're going to come to know the king. So pray for Jerusalem. Worship in Jerusalem is the subject of, of Psalm 87. Uh, now, Psalm 88 is our main subject tonight. Prayer for help in despondency. Everybody has struggled with despondency or depression at one time or another. Some have it uh, on an ongoing basis and others just occasionally. Um, but there is healing no matter what the case may be. I'm going to read Psalm 88 all the way through and it's considered one of the most depressing songs in all of the songbook. But God has a purpose in that. In our worship today, in churches, we like to keep everything upbeat and uh, happy and uh, Christ-centered. And that's what we should be doing. But in the Psalms, it's much more diverse. And they deal with human problems and uh, in an almost sermon-like fashion, they really get into it and we can learn from this negative approach because a lot of us live there part of the time and some of us live there all of the time in a very despondent, negative way. Well, this is a, uh, again a psalm of the sons of Korah. Uh, it's set to, to the Mahalath Lenoth, which was a particular song at that time. And it's a contemplation of uh, Haman the Ezraite. Apparently he wrote this and apparently he was struggling uh, with despondency. So let's work through this uh, depressing psalm, realizing that we all live in this uh, condition at least a little bit of the time and hopefully not too much. But let's also focus in on the solutions. We'll make sure we get into that. O oh Lord, God of my salvation, I have cried out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. For my soul is full of troubles and my life draws near to the grave. I am counted with those who go down to the pit. I'm like a man who has no strength, adrift among the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, and who are cut off from your hand. You have laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness, in the depths. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you have afflicted me with all your waves. You have put away my acquaintances far from me. You have made me an abomination to them. I am shut up. I cannot get out. My eye wastes away because of affliction. Lord, I have called daily upon you. I have stretched out my hands to you. Will you work wonders for the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise you? Shall your loving kindness be declared in the grave or your faithfulness in the place of destruction? Shall your wonders be known in the dark and your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? But to you, O Lord, Lord, I have cried out. And in the morning my prayer comes before you. Lord, why do you cast off my soul? Why do you hide your face from me? I have been afflicted and ready to die from my youth. I suffer your terrors. I am distraught. Your fierce wrath has gone over me. Your terrors have cut me off. They came around me all day long like water. They engulfed me altogether. Loved one and friend you have put far from me and my acquaintances into darkness. Pretty heavy. Pretty despondent. So let's close with, uh, no, we need to talk about this because we don't want to leave it on that note. But we've all been there. We can identify with this. And uh, let's be honest, we, we, we still struggle with it at times, believers and unbelievers. I don't know how the unbelievers handle it sometimes, but I know how a believer needs to handle it. So despondency is a problem for everybody at some time or another. And we see in the uh, beginning verses here, the psalmist's terrible affliction. This is depression. This is despondency. Let's go back and look at it verse by verse. Verse 1 of Psalm 88. O Lord, God of my salvation, 
So he starts off on the right note, looking to God. When you've got a problem, don't get on the internet and tell the world. Don't even bother telling your friends. Don't make somebody else's day miserable, unless you really are sincere about wanting to get prayer. Go to God first. Go to him first and say, Lord, I've got a problem. I'm despondent. I'm unhappy. I remember when I was taking care of my parents for seven years, and it was the hardest task I ever had. Um, I had to take care of them from about, oh, just all night long. I'd get home around four in the afternoon and relieve the two men that were taking care of them. And I was on duty from four in the afternoon until uh, nine the next morning, still running a church as well. And uh, I would get very little sleep. I did not sleep in bed clothes or in bed for seven years. I laid on top of the bed in sweat clothes and socks and sneakers, ready to go to the emergency room at any time. And we had more than one trip to make. Um, made a mistake of giving Dad once a, a little watch where he could press it if he needed me in the middle of the night. He loved that thing. And oh, he was pressing it and pressing it every 10, 15 minutes. I had to take it away from him. It broke my heart. He was 90 years of age, 91 years of age. I had to, I had to take it from him. And uh, he just, uh, he had other ways of communicating to, to dial me at an emergency. And one, one morning he dialed me at uh, three in the morning. It was Sunday morning and he was anxious to go to church. And I said, Dad, it's three in the morning and we're not ready to go to church yet. Well, at least we're, we're going to be ready and not going to be late. So he was excited about church. But I used to get on the phone with my brother. He and I would talk on Saturdays. He was in South Carolina. I was here. And we would talk and I'd get so upset. And my brother used to tell me, and I think wisely so, Jerry, I don't rec recommend that you do it a lot, but if you really are unhappy, complain to God. Tell him honestly how you're feeling and realize that he will heal you and he will forgive you. But go ahead and uh, tell him exactly what it is. Don't, don't hide it. It's just going to make you sicker. So I would say I'm so unhappy. I love my mom and dad, but this is a miserable situation. I, used to, I was doing the radio programs, and usually I did five 15-minute programs as we do to, for the whole week. I would do two minutes, put my head down and sleep wake up and do three more minutes, put my head down and sleep. I could sleep four or five times in a 15-minute program. It was terrible. But I did tell God how I felt. And then I repented and asked his forgiveness and started studying some scriptures to get it reversed. I know what this man is going through. So do you. O oh Lord God of my salvation, I have cried out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. For my soul is full of troubles, and my life draws near to the grave. I am counted with those who go down to the pit. I'm like a man who has no strength. Don't you feel like that? You're just absolutely bereft and just drained of strength. You're so discouraged. You're so unhappy. You just don't know what to do. God understands that. Like the slain who lie in the grave. You feel like you're dead sometimes. You just have no real feeling. You've laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness and the depths. You know, we blame God for it, and Job did too, didn't he? Job was going through some difficult times, and he had his worthless friends who came in, and they, uh, with all their wisdom, they said, Job, you've got a problem, and the problem is yours, and God's mad at you because you're a bad person. That's why you're going through this. Well, what did he call them? Worthless physicians. Worthless physicians. And, but Job got caught up in that attitude of uh, ingratitude, and it got worse and worse, and finally God, at the end of Job, had to take him to the woodshed and basically say to him, young man, he wasn't so young then, where were you when I created the heavens and the earth? Where were you when I created all these animals? What do you know about life, and what do you know about animals, and what do you know about agriculture, and what do you know about much of anything? Knock it off. And when he repented of his ingratitude, and his despondency, that's when God double-blessed him powerfully. So we need to deal with the area of ingratitude. And I, uh, I'm going to cover this more in the next program. I hope you can join us for that. But we all know what despondency is. We know how we go to God and we blame him for a lot of things. Um, and who causes despondency? Well, it can be the devil. 
Uh, it can be our own uh, nature as we look at ourselves and our situation and assess our resources or lack of them and we get very unhappy. But uh, whatever the situation might be, um, the antidote obviously is to look to the Lord. Uh, I want to say this too, while it's a spiritual problem, sometimes it can be a physical problem. When I would get despondent and de depressed, my mother, who was far more godly than I'll ever be, seemed very naive to me. I said, Mother, I'm very depressed. You know what she'd say to me? I expected some grandiose analysis of the problem of my despondency that involved all of creation and most of heaven. She'd say, did you go swimming today? What has that to do with it? She'd say, go swimming. Well, I'd go swimming and I began to feel better. Something called endorphins began to get released there. And, um, other times I'd be very depressed and she'd say, honey, did you have a good meal today? What has that got to do with it? I'm in the, I'm in the, the, the depths of the, the slow of despond, as, as the Pilgrim's Progress says. Have a good meal. You're going to feel better. You know, we are physically and emotionally and spiritually all interconnected. Spirit, soul, and body. When you've got a problem spiritually, uh, check the physical and the emotional as well as the spiritual. The spiritual, yes, get into your scriptures, pray, praise, worship, but don't neglect the emotional don't neglect the physical. Uh, sometimes the secret is hidden in those areas as well. Best thing to do, ask God for wisdom. I'm unhappy. I'm despondent. And I'm a little angry at you, God. Forgive me, but show me what's going on in here. What's going on in the heavenlies? What's going on in the natural? What's going on with my family? Or what's bothering me about this or that? What's going on in this body of mine? Am I not doing what I'm supposed to? Psychologists tell us that one of the great antidotes for despondency is to get out into nature. These are not even Christians who are saying this. Get out into nature. Look at creation. Get out and take a fresh walk. As we were praying for poor Snuggles today, I, I, I said to Kelly, you know, I can throw the ball for the dog outside. She needed to get the dog's exercise, but we had to watch little Snuggles who was barely breathing. And the Lord said to me, no, you watch Snuggles. She needs to get outside. She needs to breathe some fresh air. She needs to get a change of, sc change of scenery. Kind of work with the dog. Get her mind off of Snuggles for at least a couple of minutes. So God will show you how to get through this despondency. And I want to give you a couple of scriptures, and then we're going to close and deal with this topic more in the next uh, program. Uh, Deuteronomy 31, verse 8, is uh, what the first scripture here. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 8. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Philippians 4, verse 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. That's Philippians 4, 8. Watch your thinking. Or as they used to say, watch your stinking thinking, right? It can get you into real trouble. Watch every thought. Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4, 13. John 16 and verse 33. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. That's John 16, 33. And here's a favorite of mine, Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for peace and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. When I would be despondent, I would go to those old favorite verses from Isaiah, put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Get the praise music going. Put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And um, just, uh, just worship the Lord, get into his word, and love him, focus in on him. And then that's the spiritual side, but go out and have a good walk, breathe some fresh air, um, and uh, also... Watch what you eat, and uh, don't, don't get taken down by too much sugar and all that kind of stuff. It's all connected. Uh, if that doesn't work and you still have a problem and you're in the Albany area, 
I'll take you to a hospital visit and we'll knock on a couple of sick doors and that'll help you. Or if you want to, we'll go to prison and, and uh, visit some prisoners. That'll help you get your eyes uh, on Jesus as well. We don't make light of the problem, but there are solutions. We'll get more into it in the next hour. God bless you. Until the next time, shalom, shalom. moment your needs to supply. Return